Darren, we're, of course, super excited to have you here. It's the 20th edition of the Geomami Film Festival. Congratulations. With Thank you. Thank you. I think I speak for the hundreds of people here when I say that your cinema has enriched and disturbed me in equal measure. Um, there are images I wish I could unsee, uh, but your cinema is so powerful that I could never look away. So I want to start with the roller coaster. You said that everything about you as a filmmaker can be understood by going on the cyclone, a roller coaster in Coney Island, New York. Can you explain that? It's something I said 20 years ago, so probably not, but um, <laughs> that's the one warning is watch what you say. It lives with you for the rest of your life. Um, but I grew up in Coney Island, which is a very famous neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. Um, because it was an old amusement park, and so it's been in lots of movies. And there's a famous roller coaster there called the Cyclone that was built in 1929, which is very old for America. And um, it's also very scary. Eight people have died on it in its history, but it's still working. But it's just a beautiful, it's just incredibly well designed, and it starts off with an incredibly big scare at the beginning and then it just keeps going and it keeps surprising and it keeps making more and more scary. I actually can't remember fully why I used that metaphor, but I was probably trying to relate to the audience that it's very important to keep audiences on the edge of their seat and never knowing what's going to happen next. So, Darren, give us a sense of where do some of these images come from? You know, the climax of Requiem for a Dream, a wrestler turning a staple gun on another's body, the sound that a baby's neck makes when it breaks, and then people eating it. If we were to open up your head, what would we find? You know, nothing very different than what would, we, what would happen if we opened up your skull. Um, <laughs> but, sorry, <laughs> just get a little defensive. But um, I just, I don't know why I go after such intense ideas and themes. I think it probably has to do with um, just always thinking about um, things that are surprising, things that are exciting, things that have never been done before. I think, especially in today's world, where it's very hard to keep people's attention, you know, if you're watching a movie uh, at home on a... TV screen, you know, it's often people are also looking at their telephones um, or they're looking at their tablets. So it's about creating ideas and images and emotions that are really exciting for people and very different for people. Some of the images you described are way before smartphones existed. And I think these ideas just came out of the stories that I was trying to tell. Why I'm attracted to a certain extreme stories, I, that's something you can ask my psychologist. I can't really answer it. Um, but Requiem for a Dream, you know, there's the famous shot of the guy sticking the needle into the open wound. And uh, I knew that most people in the audience would not appreciate that. But the entire movie is actually summed up in that single shot. That shot shows you how far people go to feed their addictions. And that's what the entire movie is. So it was one of the steps I wanted to take the audience on to make them believe that eventually his arm would get cut off for his drugs and that all of these other characters would do these terrible things because that's the point of it. You know, the, the staples you talk about in The Wrestler, that's also exactly what it's about. It's how far people will push their bodies for their art. Um, and so when I was researching The Wrestler, I found actual performers who were doing that to entertain audiences. And I realized we, we would have to do some, we would have to include that because, I don't know, I, I think what the extreme parts of what people do, people are still doing them. It's what makes us human. It's figuring out why they do it. And I guess the great gift of cinema is empathy. Right? You can watch a film made here in Mumbai, you can watch a film made in South Africa, you can make, watch a film made in New York, and if the character is real, it doesn't matter what their gender, 
their orientation, their skin color, their age is, you can relate with them. That's the beauty of cinema. That's, it's an, actually watching a movie is, is practicing your empathy because you're watching a five-year-old girl in Tehran worry about a goldfish in the white balloon. You are that five-year-old girl. You are all of her worries and all of her concerns. And so presenting really extreme images on screen, if you can actually make the audience feel what that character is doing, the desperateness, the need, the pleasure, whatever it is that they need, that's expanding your own humanity. So I think it's, it's kind of all related to that. Breaking the baby's neck and uh, eating it, that was just all symbolism. That had nothing to do with it. empathy. That was just to fuck with the audience. <laughs> Not really, but it was a good joke. Darren, so many of your movies have had um, characters who are obsessed with things, whether it is wrestling or ballet or drugs, um, or, or Max in, in Pi being obsessed with finding the, you know, the, the order in the chaos. Uh, why, why these obsessed people? Why do you keep sort of going back to that? And is it, is it in any way a reflection of you? Uh, this is going to be a hard Q&A. <laughs> It's a compliment to you. I, I really like the easy answers, like, you know, how was it to work with Ellen Burstyn? <laughs> Those are the really good ones. Um, obsession. Look, I, I don't think I'm the most obsessive person in the world. I live a very balanced life. I do get obsessive when I work, um, but I chose a job where I only have to work once every two years. Um, you know, most of the time is doing research and thinking about what's next and living a very normal life where I get to travel and I get to raise my son. And, and then when I get on set, it becomes tremendous obsession. And then when you're in the editing room, it's obsession, but much, way more slowed down because you have much more time. But when I am on set and I am obsessed, I understand that character and I understand that intensity. And I guess I've been attracted in sort of um, exploring what that mindset is. I think because I ground my films in kind of real people, even in Mother, where the characters are very symbolic, they sort of are very human. People ask me those questions, but I mean, Captain America is obsessed with doing good. Like, and the Hulk is smashed with, is, is obsessed with smashing things, you know? I mean, it's, Characters are just are very consistent usually, and they and they have, they're all kind of obsessed with what they do. I think when you start to look at it in a real way, you start to really think about what it means. It was someone asked me. I was doing some press today about violence. You know about why my films are so violent. Actually, you know I hate violence, but I think I actually treat violence honestly, so that. I never try to glorify violence or I never try to trivialize violence. And I think in so many movies, especially American movies, actually I know I, you see it in movies here in India and you see it in movies in China, it's all over the world. You see violence that has no repercussions. You see people um, hurting each other, but you don't really see the cost to, even the person creating the violence, you, you don't see the cost to their spirit and the cost to the spirit of the other person. You don't ever even see the, the true physical ramifications of that violence. Um, and I think that's really dangerous, you know? But as soon as you start to really honestly look at what violence does to people that perform it, as well as people that receive it, it suddenly that's considered violent. Yet, if you see a martial arts movie where the whole thing is about people beating the shit out of each other, but there's not one drop of blood, or maybe there's one drop of blood shot in slow motion, very poetically falling to the ground, it's just, it's not really violence. It's some form of abstract dance representing it. So, so I, I, that's why I've always been interested in, or not interested in, in portraying guns that much. There's barely any guns in any of my movies because you know, what they do to the human body and what, uh, even, even the way they sound when you watch guns in movies, if, if anyone who's actually fired a gun, it's 
that's why they wear those headphones, you know, when they're practicing, because it's, it, it's just really deafening. But they don't even capture the sound of a gun realistically, and I think that stuff ends up dramatizing it, making it sexy, make, nor, it normalizes it so that that becomes part of our humanity when it's really not about who we are. But that, the violence in your films, I mean, I feel like almost like you're testing to see how much the human body can endure. I mean, the characters in your films go through so much physically. Uh, you know, in Mother, she literally had her heart pulled out at the end. So uh, I read somewhere that somebody said you turn a forensic eye on human frailty, but I think it's almost like a forensic eye on what the human body can take. Is that right? It's definitely something I was very focused on in The Wrestler and Black Swan because that, that were two different artists using their bodies as their art and sort of what happens when your instrument of art starts to get away from you. In the case of um, the wrestler, he's getting too old. And in, in the case of the ballerina, more her mind is starting to get away from her as well. I think real people, that's where our limitations and tests are. Uh, I don't know, in many ways, it's more truthful and more honest for, for what we all deal with. We all deal with illness, and we all deal with aging, and we all deal with the lim not being able to run as fast as we can. You know, the problem is most movies are dealing with superhuman people that can do anything, and not even if they're just superheroes, if they're just, you know, detectives that can kick ass or CIA agents that can kick ass. They're never dealing with the morning after and what it feels like. Even boxers, the next day, their, their hands are all swollen up and they're dealing with that reality and that pain. That's, that's the, I guess it's the, it's just honesty. It's what, what the real costs of living are. What the consequences are. Yeah. yeah. So 66 minutes of mother is Jennifer Lawrence close up. Ellen Bernstein said that uh, for Requiem, you actually t had this steady cam strapped to her body so that the, the camera could be that close to her face. Why is the close up? such a favorite of yours? I, I often say the close-up is one of the most overlooked inventions of the 20th century. It's probably one of the most important inventions. I think when filmmakers in the early 20th century were able to put the camera right next to an actor's face, everything changed for cinema. Because if you're talking to someone, I'm gonna make this really awkward right now, you barely ever really make eye contact, although you're doing a very good job. <laughs> but most of the time you're, you're thinking you're here, you're thinking down there, you're thinking about something else, but to actually tune into someone, it's a very hard thing to do because now, now I can't look at her, I'm all embarrassed. But <laughs> <clears throat> look over there, would you? <clears throat> but um, what, what the close-up allows is the camera is very close to uh, this actor and you in the dark room are not at all self-conscious about yourself. Normally when you're having a conversation, you're talking to someone, your brain is thinking about a lot of different things depending on who that person is to you. But when there's a big movie star who is often an incredibly attractive person, you're not thinking about anything except for what they're thinking. So once again, it's kind of this portal of empathy, it's, pace, it's putting you into the, you're, you're imagining what it's like to be that person with these problems that are going on. And so that's the magic of cinema, is, is the close-up. My favorite actors are actors with great eyes. I think the eyes are the most important thing on, on an actor, and eyes that you can really see into, and that through those eyes they can express so much. So like Russell Crowe, the tiniest, muscle in his lower eyelid can twitch it and every single person in the world understands that the same emotion is where great talent comes from. And there's certain actors that have that ability with so little you can feel so many different things. Have you ever had an actor say, you're too close, just move it away? No, they don't, they want you to, they want you to be inside them if you could. <laughs> They're actors. 
I mean, they're usually worried about like a line or a pimple and you just say, just lie to them. Dan, when you are creating, do you ever think about how far can I push this before the audience will stop looking? I mean, do you ever wonder, will they turn away? There are things that I have shot that will never see the light of day. Tell all. <laughs> no, you don't want to know. But it always has to service the story. So you want to take the audience on a trip and you want to constantly jolt them to keep them interested, but you never want to do anything that's going to be so extreme that they're going to not want to be there with you anymore. So once again, you're thinking, what's the audience thinking? What are they connecting to? And what can I show them that's going to surprise them, wow them, maybe scare them, but never go so far that I'm going to lose them? So yeah, I mean, there's, it's always about how far to push it. And there's definitely stuff you hold back and you say, no, you know what, that was too much. Those places are where you end up fighting with the studio or the people with money. So for instance, the scene in Black Swan, um, when Natalie is, pulls the feather out of her back, and then the final thing is her knee cracks back the wrong way, and then the other knee cracks back the other way, and she falls over. The studio was like, that's too fucking far. And I was like, no, it's hilarious. <laughs> and um, we fought about it, and eventually I won. And then I remember sitting at, the, at one of the premieres, and when that happened, there were some screams of horror, but there, were all, there was also people who laughed. And I was like, you see, it's hilarious. <laughs> and then I got the best compliment because someone was working on a Ridley Scott movie on, on the Prometheus, and, he said, and they told me that Ridley Scott pulled everyone into his office to show him that scene as, as a good thing, not as a bad thing, so it was nice. How did you get baby eating past the money people? The baby eating was in the, was in the script at the beginning. They knew it was going to be there. I mean, they were terrified, but I, I probably didn't do it. Jennifer Lawrence probably did it because she's such a big star. She was able to, they wanted to make the movie. If I had presented them a script without baby eating, they would have been a lot happier. Dan, talk us through your writing process. You've written five of the seven films you've made, all except Black Swan and The Wrestler. I read that you have this custom-built desk, uh, which has like 25 puzzles and sliding drawers or something. What, what is this thing? Where do you write? I met a young artist that was doing really cool stuff, and I convinced him to work with me on this project. Most of my writing happens in different places. It doesn't always happen there. There's different moments for different places. Sometimes I'll go to a really, really, really bad, shitty motel. Do you know what a motel is versus a hotel? And uh, many of those are owned by Indians. And I'll just go. I'll go to like a. I'll go to a really bad place just to hate my environment. So it forces me just to focus on writing. Um, sometimes writing comes easy. Sometimes it comes hard, and you just have to figure out the best environment to to do the work. And this custom built desk. Nothing happens here. It's a puzzle desk. So sometimes the pu I can't remember how to open the puzzle, so I can't get a pen out. So it's kind of a pain in the ass. So your actors tend to win Oscar nominations. Uh, Ellen Burstyn, of course, also Marissa Tomei, Mickey Rourke, Natalie Portman, who won for Black Swan. Uh, can you take us through the process of how you work with actors? I, I know you actually attended acting school for a bit. Yeah, I'm, I never really went to acting school. I took acting classes because I knew it was a weak part uh, on my side. When I started directing, I really had no idea what actors were doing. So I wanted to understand it, so I took an acting class and my, my promise to myself was the day I could cry in front of the audience or the class without being self-conscious, I would quit. And that day came and I quit the next day. And I think it was just about understanding what it takes to do something like that, to be that emotionally open to, uh, not strangers, but to people 
you sort of know from acting class. How many classes did it take for you to get to that point? I think it was about three, three months of work. So you went to acting class for three months? I, I did three months. Worked yourself to a place where you could cry? I cried, and then I quit. And, and before that, I had done a lot of classes on how to direct an actor, which was generally taught by directors who never had directed an actor, who thought they had the lesson. But... <laughs> It's about communication and trust. It helps that I now have a decent track record with actors so that um, other actors can say, oh, he's gonna help me get to this place so I can trust him. But as far as for the young filmmakers out there, it's very much about spending the time with an actor, trying to figure out what they're gonna need to feel safe. Because you, what you're trying to do is create an environment where they can take risk and where they want to take risk. Uh, a lot of actors will take chances and then get burnt by their directors. What I mean, they get taken advantage of and then they end up, instead of being an open flower, they end up closing. And your job is very much as a director is to take that flower and make it open up as much as possible to show all of its beauty, to show all of its humanity and uh, to not hold anything back. And uh, so you just have to figure out how to do that. I'm gonna do that, and the best way is, is generally being honest and being trustworthy, you know. Sometimes little tricks can help, but you only wanna trick an actor if they're, if they're a game and open and they wanna be tricked that something can help them. For instance, like, <clears throat> you know, sometimes you'll, you'll get one, you're trying to get an actor scared and if you have enough trust, they know at some point you're gonna blow an air horn next to them just to help them get scared. But you don't wanna do that to a stranger. You wanna do that to someone who knows that you're just, you're, you're, on the, you're in, working on the same project, trying to get to the same result. So what's the most joyous part of filmmaking for you? Every part of the process has good things and bad things. Um, you know, no matter how hard writing is, the discovery that emerges every once in a while when an idea comes together can be really thrilling and exciting. On set, when you've been preparing a shot for a long time and you call action and all of these incredible artists are working together to dance together to create this one moment and everything's clicking. And then in the edit room, you know, when suddenly a scene is coming together in a way that's unexpected or it just makes you laugh at how well it's happening. The whole process has a lot of great gifts to it. There's also a lot of, you know, pain and struggles and fear if things are gonna work out. But I think you ha have to have those dark moments for the, for the light moments to emerge. I know what you don't like. You said that the worst day for a director is when he or she first sits down with the editor after they've put the, they've yeah. assembled the footage. Why is that so bad? It's funny because I was, you know, Martin Scorsese has that master class thing, and the first quote is like talking about that exact same moment. So it was nice to hear it from the master as well. But it's true, no matter how much you prepare, for that moment when the editor puts together that first assemblage of everything you've done. Because when you finish shooting a movie, you feel so great. It's just been a marathon. It's like w winning a marathon. You, you just finished it, you're exhausted, you're often sick, and then you usually get a week or two weeks off you know, to get your life back together, but to get your health back together. And, and also the editor needs that time to finish assembling everything. And then you go in and you tell yourself, it's gonna suck, it's gonna suck, I know it's gonna suck, but then it really, really, really sucks. <laughs> it's true. Does then, it always suck? And, you, you, and then you just, you know the next day you're gonna be hung over because you just immediately have to go and start drinking because <laughs> you realize you're gonna be in the room with this editor for the next few months. I mean, months and months of work still have to happen. And then, the, you know, two days later, you get in there and you start chipping away and start figuring out how to make it work. And that first time you just see the flaws and what you missed? I mean, it's all bad. Everything's bad about it. It's interesting, it's like, people tell you that they're really trained and that they know how to look at what we call a rough cut, but, it's not true. No one knows how to look at it. 
And even you as a filmmaker, you're sitting there and you know you've done better work. It's just never represented on the screen. And, I, and I'm working with the same editor for four films now, and he knows what I like and what doesn't work, and he gets it really close, but it just still has so much work. And beyond the visual part of it, there's so much sound work and there's so much other work that really comes together to make a film make sense. Now, speaking of sound, so much of the experience of your cinema is the soundtrack. It's so distinctive and so much a part of that haunting experience that, that your cinema gives us. Uh, but when you cut, you cut to no music, not even temp music. Why? Because I, I think it's cheating. I think music's only going to make something better. It sometimes fixes things, but it's never going to be as hard to look at something without music because it's just honest. You're just looking at sound and dialogue, and that's all you have to work with. And it was interesting, because Mother actually has no score. It's the first movie I've done without a score. It's a two-hour-long film without any music. And I was terrified at it, doing that at first, but what I realized is music is such a powerful tool um, for a filmmaker. It's really telling the audience how they're supposed to be feeling. And the whole exercise of Mother is I did not want the audience to ever know how Jennifer Lawrence's character was feeling. So the second we put music into the movie, it just fell apart, it fell flat, because suddenly everyone w was much more comfortable. And I wanted the audience to be uncomfortable like the character in the film the whole time. Darren, have you changed um, a lot as a director, because I, I, I read this interview of yours where you said, um, now when I see Requiem, I don't even know who that person was who made right. that film. Um, how much have you changed? And how are you different? I mean, it, you're constantly changing. It, what, what I was talking about is at some point I had to look at a, a, at a copy of Requiem for a Dream when they were redoing a Blu-ray version of it, and I hadn't seen it in many years. And I could remember shooting every single scene, but I could never have made that film now, just because it's just not what I'm interested in, what I'm focused on. So I think you always have to be open and present to who you are and what interests you. If you end up trying to make something that you made before, that's the only mistake you can make. You have to constantly keep looking forward and seeing what the next thing is that interests you. So what, what does interest you now? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, a lot of things interest me, uh, uh, but how I'm going to think about it and write about it, I'm not sure yet. So from the beginning, Dan, the, the films have been polarizing. Of course, Pi was sort of universally acclaimed and, and, you know, everybody no, said... No, no, it wasn't. Well, people said it's the arrival of a great talent, a major talent at Sundance. No, that's not true. Come on. <laughs> yes. The New York Times called it inky and a jarring score. <laughs> okay, then you're superbly consistent because after that was The Fountain. Which no, after no. that was Requiem for a Dream. Right, Requiem, but then... It's okay, the I'll do the interview from now on here. <laughs> and, sorry, I'm teasing you. But Requiem, Requiem for a Dream was, was savaged by critics. It's got like a 72 on a Rotten Tomato. But, but, how, and then, I'm sure and then the, fou here, the Fountain was a 50 on Rotten Tomatoes. But the Fountain, I read, got, first it was booed at the Venice Film Festival, and then the next day got a standing ovation. Something like that. <laughs> and yeah. all the way now to Mother, which uh, Rex Reed, a film critic, said is the worst film of 2017. No, no, um, no, 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 no. He said it's the worst film of the century. Oh, the century! <laughs> Let's get it right. Not ooh, that's yes. <laughs> Come on, to be called the worst film of the century? That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, did you, didn't you say you topped the list and you're like, that, that's amazing? But, but yeah. Martin Scorsese wrote this very eloquent piece in the, in the Hollywood Reporter, defending it and saying something like, only a true passionate filmmaker could have made this picture, which I'm still experiencing weeks after I saw it. So how do you process these completely different responses? You know, I don't think it's like a conscious decision I wish that I could make fully beloved experiences that filled me emotionally. 
It's just never what I've been attracted to. I think when I was younger, I've always been interested in alternative culture and alternative art. It's just where my tastes have always been. I, I, look, I, I appreciate big mainstream Hollywood movies, but to wake up every single day and fight for something you believe in, you really better believe in it. And so I usually choose things that inspire me because there's something, it's, it's much greater than, than I am, it's much greater than my friends or my community, it's, it's just something that I feel I, I wanna spend years um, making, you know. Like Requiem for, you know, after Pi, people wanted to make whatever I, you know, they were like, what do you wanna make? We'll make whatever you wanna make. And I showed them Requiem for a Dream, the novel, and people didn't even respond with a phone call to say no. It was just no way. You know, for me, that was like, I consider Hubert Selby Jr. one of the great American writers. And for me, he was very much like a god, and I was just a disciple, and I was going to interpret his work. So I was able to sort of surrender to that. The Fountain, once again, no one wanted to make. It took me six years to make it, and then it didn't do well, and suddenly I didn't have a career. And then I wanted to make The Wrestler with Mickey Rourke, and no one wanted to make that. We went to every single person in the world who was giving money for movies, and everyone said no. Eventually, we figured out how to get it done. And then after The Wrestler had its success, we went to every single person in the world with Black Swan, which had Natalie Portman and Vincent Cassell and, you know, a pretty big cast. Every single person said no. They said horror, horror fans don't li like ballet and ballet fans don't like horror. <laughs> so we had to beg to make that film. So every single project has been that way because I think... We're just making what, we th what we're interested in, and we just keep pushing and fighting and trying to figure out a way to get it made. I guess what's kept me going is all of those no's is kind of what makes it fun and worth doing. But over the years, Darren, your name um, sort of was loosely attached, or I, I don't know whether it was just, you know, very initial stages with a couple of superhero movies. I mean, Batman, Wolverine. Um, I wonder what would a Darren Aronofsky superhero film be like? And have you ever been tempted? It'd be exactly like every other superhero movie you've seen. Really? I think so. I mean, look, there'd be a few like weird, cool shots, but I, you can't really, you all, uh, I mean, you know, they're superhero movies. So I got involved with them because I was always, there was always a certain amount of fear that after I make this movie, I'll never be able to work again. So they were kind of like, um, I thought, well, if I can't work again, I'd do something like that. But I've been lucky enough over the years to continue to make films that are a little bit different. So you were genuinely never tempted by just the idea of a massive sort of global movie? I didn't want it. Noah. Yes, of course. $130 no, was, million dollars was the budget? Yes, and it made, a lot, it made a lot of money and was a big global hit, but it was, um, I got to, it was the story I wanted to tell, told on the terms I wanted to make it. So, it, you know, and there was no, like, the IP, the intellectual property, you know, you know that term? You know, it was the Bible, not Marvel. So it was kind of... <laughs> Dan, you seem to have a special connect with India. This is your sixth trip, you said. And um, I read that uh, the first time around when the fountain fell apart, when Brad Pitt pulled out some six or seven weeks before filming, you came here in some sort of self-imposed exile. You came back after the film released. Uh, what is the connect with India? When you're directing, you're a complete control freak, and you have to worry about every single detail that's going on. When you come to India, you can't control anything. <laughs> I mean, every, every street you cross, you'll never get to the side of the side. You'll, you'll never get exactly to the other side where you want it. It's just like, uh, so I like to come and just sort of get lost here. And I've always, it's every twist and turn, every corner that you go around is always interesting and surprising. 
So for me, it's, it's a lot of fun to, to, to be here and to explore. Um, and I just try to get back here whenever I can. Okay, one last question and I'll open it up. Um, what's the most important sort of quality for a director to have? I mean, I think the biggest thing is persistence. It, not just in persistence in getting a film started and made, it's a persistence of vision when you're on the set and there's always many reasons for you to change your vision or to compromise your vision. You know, once again, looking at that place across the street you want to get to, and as all the tut-tuts and bikes and cars and cows are crossing in the way that you can definitely sort of still get across the street and sort of end up in, this, in the general same area. Um, that's kind of the trip in filmmaking, but it's not a, a solo vision. I think it's you have that vision, and then you're crossing that street with a lot of collaborators, and it's about those collaborators that help kind of shape and direct the vision, and by the time you get across the street, it's suddenly something new and something different that belongs to everyone. Uh, so I think, I think persistence is a big, big part, because once you're a director on set and you're not clear on what you want, then things start to fray. Okay, guys. Let's have questions. Uh, my name is Mayak and uh, one of the things that I love about your films is that uh, all of them have been shot on film format and uh, why do you go back to that format and what do you think its future is in cinema? It ultimately doesn't really matter. I think what matters is your, its storytelling and there's many, many different ways to tell stories. Personally, I love the aesthetic of film. <clears throat> I also love the process of working with film. There's something magical about shooting film and then sending it off to the lab and not knowing till the next day or a few days later. Or in the case of my first film, Pi, we, didn't, we got dailies twice. We got dailies halfway through the shoot and at the end of the shoot. Um, just because we didn't have the money to get it done quicker. But there's something very magical when it comes back and you see it again and something happens in the alchemy because you're not there in the three-dimensional space and your memory starts filling in what it is and then suddenly a new reality comes back to you. I like that process. I also like the way it looks, you know, the grain and the fact that, um, you know, a lot of the digital formats are making every film look very, very similar. You're all starting off with some very, something very, very similar. And when you work in film, there's definitely something that gives it a, a bit of a different look. But I don't think it's necessarily appropriate for everything. I think every story has a purpose and, and should have its own film grammar. I think if I was starting off now, there, right now, and I was a young filmmaker, how many people are filmmakers here? Okay, great. So we're talking to filmmakers. So, you know, I would definitely not be working in film at this point. I would probably be working with my iPhone, you know, to tell a story and figuring out what's the best way to exploit vertical framing to do a movie or something. I would be playing with uh, the latest and the, and the cheapest to just tell stories because once again, it comes down to storytelling. The thing that's the most valuable thing in the world is your personal stories. There's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna to try to make the next big Bollywood or Hollywood movie, but figure out your take on it, your interpretation. And, and I know for a long time here in India, there weren't that many pathways forward um, with films outside the Bollywood system, but it feels like that's changing that, and that there's other ways that you can express other type of more personal stories. So, I don't know, that's, that's what I would lean into, is just figuring out what is the best format for the story that I need to tell, and then to use it. Hello, ma'am. Nice hat. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, Darren, I'm Ishan, and um, uh, this question is inspired by the little chat you had about close-ups, and um, I was wondering what comes to mind when I ask, what's your favorite close-up from one of your films? My favorite close-up. I don't know. I, what's your favorite close-up? You don't have one either. You're in the same place. 
Uh, I don't know. I got to give me a. It, the knees. It's, it's not in a close up, it's a medium shot, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sorry, I don't want to be an asshole, but I'm still, I'm still from Brooklyn, and so every once in a while, I'm an asshole. Um, oh, you know what, I'll tell you a good close-up. When Ellen Burstyn, and this was a very interesting moment, but when Ellen Burstyn um, is given some type of, like, drug to slow her down when she's in the asylum, and she just sort of zonks out, it was a very, very early use of uh, digital manipulation because people weren't doing it quite yet. It was just very new technology. But if you look at it, what we did is, so she's, she's kind of freaking out, so they give her, they shoot her up with some type of drug and she passes out. And as she's passing out, we like took all of her facial features and just slightly shrunk them in. Just a little bit, just like, you know, with a good sound effect that's like a whoa, and her whole face shrinks. And it was, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah, can you hear me now? Is this, is this good? Like, for instance, I saw Mother, and sound plays such an important part in it, even though you haven't used a score. And I, I, my question was, when you're writing, when you're writing the script, does that come in then, at that point, when you're putting in, I don't know, for instance, you know, the, the cup sliding on, on the table right now, or the clank, or the clink, or whatever, the smallest things that sometimes enhance a scene or, or don't? Does that come at, at, at the early stage or is it something, you know, you, you make the film and you sit back on the editing table and say, hey, you know what, I'm just gonna up this and I'm gonna down this and see where it goes or is it part of the whole plan? Because I think it's, it plays a huge part in your films. Um, it's almost emotional. Like in Mother, I thought, I mean, sound was, you know. Thank you. I don't, I don't know what that means, but yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I mean, sound design, it, I don't think you're, many people are conceiving that much about sound design at the script phase. There's some bigger ideas about an approach to sound, and sometimes there's very, very specific sounds that we want to get. For instance, in Mother, we knew the sounds of the house was going to be a very, very big part. Exactly. So uh, we brought a sound design team into the house we were shooting, and when we were not shooting, they were recording all different types of sounds because we knew that we were going to have to replace a lot of dialogue and a lot of sound and that the sound itself of the house was a character. So we were thinking about it, but you don't really creatively know how you're going to use it until you sort of capture the movie as a whole and start to, and, and start to put it all together. So it's not like when you're writing it, it's not the birds chirping that's there in the script, but... Some, sometimes. sometimes. I mean, there's a, always a few. In Requiem for a Dream, the hip-hop montages were very clear that they were going to be sound and image cut together, and, you know, but, but we didn't know exactly what those images were going to be until we started to shoot them and see which looked best visually, and then the sound that came with them. Like in Noah, <clears throat> when all of the humanity died, when I was younger, I had been in the Philippines, and I had seen them kill a pig, and hearing the sound of the pig dying was so human-like that I was like, when we were starting to talk about what people dying would sound like, I was, I was like, go to a pig farm and, and see them killing pigs, which was a very hard thing to do because no one wants you to have that sound because it's, you know, anyway, it's pretty, it's pretty awful sound. Anyone hear a pig die before? No, you bunch of city folk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Dan, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Dan.